Good afternoon and welcome back everybody to another edition of the BH virtual event space. We hope you didn't miss us too much, but the good news is now we're back. We've got Bob Christ with us. Bob, welcome. How are you today? Thank you. I'm fine and I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, always a pleasure. We're super excited. Uh, no pressure on you. I, I didn't tell you this in the green room, but you are you are our first event back from break. So no pressure on your shoulders over there. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I know that uh, professional photographers around the world have have uh, nervous breakdowns when B and H closes for those long vacations. <laughs> so so believe me, everybody's relieved that you're open again. <laughs> exactly. And and if you're upset that we were closed for so long, we apologize. It's not Bob's fault. You can you can blame <laughs> me personally. If you want to if you want to send any angry emails, I'll take them all. I'll take the responsibility. But uh, <laughs> Bob's going to be talking today about authentic travel photography in the age of Instagram. It's 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 all about the Instagram era. So I want to give a huge thank you to our sponsors over at Sony, uh, who without any of their sponsorships, this wouldn't be possible to have wonderful people like Bob with us. Uh, just a reminder, if this is your first time joining us here, and you haven't joined us before, if you're on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab to ask Bob any questions you may have about anything during the presentation. If you're joining us on Vimeo or Facebook, you can go ahead and just comment in the comment section, and we'll get to those questions at the end of the presentation. But thank you again to Bob and Sony, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Bob. Thanks for being here. All righty. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to uh, try to uh, um, address today is is a question of of trying to remain authentic uh, as we travel around and and shoot pictures, and it's a it's a struggle, and it it always has been from the time when you know it was travel magazines and print and shooting on film, and you know you uh, to now when we're shooting for our gram and everything. So uh, I'm going to start um, uh, jump right in. I'm going to go into screen share here. Share sound and select the window. And let's start to talk about <clears throat> um, authentic travel in the age of Instagram. And I'm going to start with a little uh, slideshow of some of my work that was done by the Wall Street Journal a few years ago. Um, <clears throat> and just as a, as a side on this uh, Wall Street Journal article, my dad was a businessman. And he was in his late 80s, and he was still convinced that nobody could make a living taking pictures of travel things like I did. So he was convinced uh, that I was either a drug dealer or a CIA agent. And it wasn't until the Wall Street Journal did this little article in this little uh, uh, auto slideshow uh, that he actually believed that I had the career I told him I had. So uh, I, my hat is always off to the Wall Street Journal for uh, uh, re-establishing uh, my uh, legitimacy uh, with my dad. So um, here we go. Uh, it's about two minutes. For me, a good travel photograph not only shows what a place looks like, but what it feels like as well. It captures that ambiance, that spirit of place. Recently, I've been shooting more and more black and white. It's bringing me back to my roots as a newspaper photographer, and I like the mythic quality it gives to the great monuments. I like to shoot at the edges of the day, early morning and late evening, because the light at those times of day is so beautiful. Showing the viewer different perspectives on a place is important, and that means getting up in the air sometimes. Or going under the water.
But my favorite subject is people, and I'll never miss an opportunity to shoot a festival or a procession. Now, a lot of photo enthusiasts use their cameras kind of like shields to protect them from interacting with the locals. But I like to think of the camera as an excuse to reach out and make contact with people. It takes a little practice, but once you overcome your shyness, your pictures will be so much richer for the effort. all of my travels, it's my encounters with people that I remember the best. People often ask me, what's your favorite place? And that's a difficult question to answer because I've been to over 125 countries on all seven continents, and I really like them all. But if I were forced to pick one, I'd say that my favorite place is the next place, the place I haven't been before. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so despite my youthful looks, uh, I've been in the business for quite a few decades now. And, um, you know, uh, the one constant is change and, and travel photography has certainly changed um, even since the time I started in the 70s. Uh, the world is smaller, not literally, but uh, figuratively. Uh, access to media is faster and universal. Uh, it's gotten to the point where everyone has seen everything and been everywhere and probably shot it with their phone. So it's really hard to surprise people anymore. It's really hard to to make a splash with what I call uh, cheap exoticism, you know, where, where you, you can get to a place that nobody else can get to. And that was a, a big part of travel photography for a while. Um, but it, it wasn't all, always that way. Now, um, don't worry. Um, I'm not going to be another old gray beard pining online for the good old days. Uh, but in order to kind of take a look at the historical context of what we do when we travel and photograph, I'm going to go back to an even more ancient gray beard to see how much it's changed. We're going to go way back to the beginning um, uh, uh, when travel photography was kind of first invented by this guy, Burton Holmes, in the late 1800s. He more or less in, invented travel photography. Um, it's hard to overstate what a phenomenon he was when he came back from all these exotic places around the world with pictures that he was able to uh, project in, uh, in music halls and concert halls all over America. Uh, and he went everywhere. He went places that we can't go today because they're too militarized, they're too dangerous. He was everywhere around the world. He was a heck of a photographer, even though he had to use the big equipment. And, um, and it was a good profession for him. For 60 years, he was more or less America's eyes on the rest of the world until television and, and, and everything was invented and National Geographic started to come into its own. But, um, and, and as the original travel photographer, he became rich and famous. Um, it's really hard to overstate what a, what a star he was. He has a star on Hollywood Boulevard. He was, um, <clears throat> He was a multimillionaire in the early 1910s. Um, he lived a lavish lifestyle and was like Mick Jagger, George Clooney, and PewDiePie all rolled into one. I mean, can you imagine a multimillionaire travel photographer? You know, we English majors back when I was in college would call that an oxymoron. It, you know, it just doesn't exist. But that's how, how famous he was. Um, and that was the perks of being the original and that times the only travel photographer working you know and um like many of us are doing today he got into motion in the latter part of his career and and did a lot of uh, uh movies but you know that was then uh he was the only guy now we're all we're all photographers and we are all traveling um 
he gave some advice. He said he traveled for the experience and he photographed for the memories. We kind of photograph for different reasons now. These are a couple of his more famous sayings. The only things I own which are still worth what they have cost me are my travel memories, the mind pictures of places which I've been hoarding like a happy miser. To travel is to possess the world, you know. Um, he had the right idea about it. Now, that was then. This is now. And here is some um, camera advice I read in a blog about traveling and photography recently. It's all about the likes. Remember, he who dies with the most followers wins. Now, I'm not sure. I think there's a little tongue in cheek here going. But the fact is that we're kind of traveling for different reasons now and photographing for different reasons because of the new structure of how success is defined in photography. In my era, it was assignments from magazines. In this era, it's followers on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and whatever. But that kind of aesthetic has kind of shifted the aesthetic a little bit. The rise of platforms like Instagram have ushered in a new aesthetic. And it's a little more of instead of saying, hey, look at this, look at this fantastic world and stuff. It's like, hey, look at me looking at this, you know. Uh, and so it, it tends to be, even though we travel to expand our horizons, our horizons tend to be filtered through us more and more these days. Um, and I ask as an old guy, and I know it, uh, does traveling and shooting like this profoundly change us? Does it inform or educate our viewers? I'm not so sure. Are we shooting just to foment FOMO and our friends and get branding collabs? You know, it's, um, uh, there's a little bit of, uh, hey, look at me, and uh, I'm living a life that you're not, that goes into this. And there's always an element of that when you're traveling, I mean, from, from the get-go. But, but why, why are we doing what we do and how can we try to make it as authentic as possible? Is this travel photography that we're doing lately or is it glorified vacation snap shooting? Uh, I'm not so sure. Now I'd like to say, don't get me wrong, travel photography has always had an element of seeking out the previously shot great views. You know, uh, as a professional travel photographer working for magazines and, and building my travel stock files, I always needed to get my share of what I called well-executed cliches of the area I was covering. And in those days, uh, it was especially important because travel stock photography was still a viable source of income. I can remember when I started really traveling worldwide in the early 80s, if you had a nice set of pictures of the Taj Mahal at sunset and sunrise, those pictures would earn you money. Um, not so anymore because there are millions of them out there, maybe billions, I don't know. Um, but even at that, that was only about a third of the job, seeking out those well-executed cliches, getting those skylines, getting those, those, those Graham winners, you know. Um, the rest was seeking out and documenting stories about the region's people, its culture, the local lifestyle. Um, now it seems it's mostly about the view and more specifically getting a selfie with the view. And in a way, we're not so much traveling as we are trophy hunting. So how can we, how can we bring this back? How can we bring this back to a more kind of authentic uh, depiction of what it is to travel? Because it's really important to travel, especially this day and age, especially for Americans. We tend to uh, be afraid of the rest of the world a lot of the time because we're, we don't get out much, you know. Um, but it has kind of um, engendered a set of false expectations for when we do travel. And I just want to share a 30 second clip here from one of my favorite um, YouTube travel vloggers, uh, Hannah from Australia. She's a thinking, a real thinking traveler and a really good uh, cinematographer too. But she describes her initial encounter with Bali that was kind of informed by her perusal of Instagram and uh, 30 seconds. So I went to Bali about three years ago. Oh, whoops, hold on, let me go back. Sorry, I hit. So 
I went to Bali about three years ago for a weekend getaway because it was cheap and it was close to Singapore. And yeah, it was all right. It was, uh, it was fun, it was kind of dirty, a little bit crowded, but overall it was a really fun place. But it was nothing like the tropical paradise that I see on Instagram every day. Bali is everywhere on Instagram. We all want to get that perfect shot in a flowy dress on a swing in the rice field, eating breakfast in an infinity pool on a love heart shaped bird's nest on the beach with a coconut so that we can show our friends that we live, laugh, love our life. Okay. It's hard. It's hard to live up to the fantasy. And, uh, and this is, you know, kind of the typical thing. Now, look, again, as a travel photographer, I always put a nice shine on the places that I was photographing. I could have just as easily concentrated on the negative aspects. But, you know, I, I'm a kind of half glass, half full guy. So it wasn't hard for me to, to take a, a rose colored uh, eyeglass view of almost any place I wanted because I love to travel. I love new places and everything. But you know, uh, here's our, 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 our Balinese uh, dream image. And, and, you know, here's the reality. There's no reflecting pool there. It's a, it's an old beat up kind of yard. And um, the reflecting pond is a small piece of glass held in place uh, by a, by a very creative um, Balinese photographer and newly wealthy because he, uh, he has a line of people waiting that stretches back to the entrance of the temple to get that special mirrored shot. And it's, it's just not really there. So, um, so what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Because it's a, it's a problem, uh, I think. You know, we used to want to learn about how to photograph others in our travels. Now, now we want to learn how to shoot ourselves. And uh, believe me, after you reach a certain age, you're, you're finished shooting yourself. I have probably fewer selfies of my 40 year career than most young photographers have of their last four day trip out of the city for the country weekend. So um, it's important to realize, I think, that it's not about us when we travel, it's about them. It's about the places we go and the people that we're, we should be meeting. Um, it's about developing an interest in the lives of others. It's using the camera as a license to be curious, not a license to brag with or an instrument to brag with. And I think the key is to stop being a, a sightseeing trophy hunter and start traveling and interacting. So um, this was a big problem for me near the end of my uh, still, still shooting career. I mean, I still shoot stills, of course. Uh, but I, I kind of segued over to video about 10 years ago, and I had a number of reasons. And um, one of the reasons was that magazines were folding. There was no longer an outlet for that kind of uh, photography in story form, the long, the long form story. The, the magazines were, were folding left, right and center. And even the good travel magazines that did good cultural coverage were either folding or turning themselves into lifestyle type magazines in an attempt to woo younger readers and younger ad buyers. This was the struggle of print to stay relevant. Uh, travel stock photography had already been commodified and made just about worthless. And even the National Geographic Traveler, not National Geographic Magazine, but National Geographic Traveler, in the final years, looked like a fashion catalog layout for the cast of Friends Goes on Vacation uh, uh, was the aesthetic, you know. And the irony was that, you know, uh, the readership was between 50 and death, but you never saw anybody over 30 years of age pictured in the, in the pages of that magazine. So it was like, um, you know, it was all spreads of plates of food and cups of cappuccino and, and Jennifer Aniston lookalikes laughing at cafe tables. I didn't ever want to shoot a spread like this again. It was just, it just, it, it wasn't to me, this was not uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, this was um, some, some art buyers fantasy of, of lifestyle in a, in a South American city. So um, the reason I kind of switched to, to making travel documentaries was that it gave me the authorship and the ability to tell what I felt were more authentic stories uh, and not create a fantasy world of travel for art buyers. And um, 
it it worked. I mean, uh, it, um, these days now, I'd say 95% of any commission work I have is in video and everything. But I'm a still photographer started on the newspaper. And I just can't give up um, that that still image, I still, you know, love to, to pursue it. And a funny thing happened, uh, as more of my work for clients and personal work was done in motion, I became very selective about the type of stills that I shot. Um, on these motion assignments, I had only time to do stills of people in places that really, really spoke to me. Suddenly, I wasn't filling in the shot list for an art director. I was shooting for myself. And this, I think, is the, is the lesson here. Don't shoot for your gram, shoot for yourself. Um, and for some reason, when I started shooting for myself, I went back to my roots in black and white. And, um, and the results were um, a series of portraits and landscapes that I wanted to put into a book because I felt after a career of 40 years doing travel photography for just about every major travel magazine there was, this was the body of work that I wanted my kids to remember me by, not, not my stories of Bali for travel and leisure and stuff like that. So, um, so I'd like to share with you some of the, 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 the timeless places and old souls that, that I've encountered over the years and, and maybe give you some idea of some of the experiences that yield these kind of pictures and what the pictures can mean to you and also the people whom you're photographing. Um, so Mongolia is one of my favorite places. I don't know what it is about the Gobi Desert. You know, I start to feel a little freaked out uh, in the American West, but something about the big, vast Gobi Desert speaks to me. Don't ask me why. Uh, but uh, it's one of my favorite places to go. And the Mongolian people are are just the have the biggest hearts. And they're, they're rough, tough, um, nomadic people, but there's something about them that I relate to. And, um, and I've been there many, many times in many different seasons. And one time, uh, I was there uh, piggybacking a magazine assignment on a speaking gig that I had in China. And I was way too late in the year to visit the Gobi, but a friend of mine uh, owns a little gear camp. Uh, we call them gears. They're not, uh, that's the name of those tents. They're not um, yurts. That's the Russian word for them. The, the Mongolian word is, is gears. And, and a friend of mine runs a, a nice gear camp and he kept it open for me late in the season. My wife, Peggy and I were the only guests so I could get out into the Gobi to shoot some sand dunes for about three days. Well, we got caught in a blizzard that they canceled the flights for about three days. And all of a sudden next door to our, our gear, uh, a nomadic family was putting up this extra gear. And this is what they call a kitchen gear. And they were preparing for some kind of a family um, affair. Um, and we didn't know what, uh, we didn't speak Mongolian. They didn't speak much English. The, the folks at the camp were, uh, there was only a couple of people like a watchman and a, a chef. So we weren't really sure what was happening, but we helped them build their gear. Uh, it was a nice sunny day. The snow had, s had stopped. And uh, it was amazing to see how quickly these, these guys can get their, uh, their tents up and uh, how warm and insulated they are. And that's my wife, Peggy. And it turns out that, um, the reason that they were building this kitchen gear is that there was going to be a huge gathering of the, this nomadic family because um, it was time for the youngest child's first haircut ceremony. Now, in Mongolia, they don't celebrate year one, year two, year three. They don't even recognize birthdays until the child's hair is long enough to cut. And that's called the first birthday ceremony. And it's a big deal nomads with their camels coming from from miles around and they had us in of course to drink some uh uh you know spoiled yak milk or whatever it is uh mare's milk mare's milk uh oof, an acquired taste uh it'll never be on my uh top 10 travel foods but um you can't refuse the hospitality and we got invited to come back later when everybody showed up um for the first haircut ceremony and um, and they were slaughtering a, a couple of lambs and and everything, and we were helping out with that. And we went back and uh, put on our best down coat to come back over to the celebration. And by the time we got back there, the it was wall to wall Mongolians in this gear, and everybody everybody was well lit 
with uh, the favorite vodka, Chinggis Khan vodka. And so as the only Westerners there, they, they bring us in, there's no place to sit. And they start pouring the fermented mare's milk and the Chinggis Khan vodka. And there's no potted flowers that you can dump this into. We're right in the middle there and we're like the honored guests. And my wife just keeps, you know, handing hers to me and I've got to drink it. And the minute you drink it, they fill it up again. And so <clears throat> the whole tent was rocking and rolling, not only from my perspective, but from everybody's perspective. Meanwhile, the, the, the procedure is that they pass the child around. In this case, he's got a little Frisbee. And the idea is you take a chunk of his hair and you throw in an offering. And, uh, and believe me, um, at one point, I didn't know how that kid still had ears at the end of the night because everybody was well away. And at one point of the night, um, they start singing and, and it's, a, it's a round of singing. And they're singing Mongolian folk songs and everybody has to sing and every, even the honored guests. So we didn't know any Mongolian folk songs, but I was pretty, pretty well away. Peggy was still uh, functioning and uh, came to our turn and we didn't know what to sing. So uh, we looked at each other. We went real deep into the Lennon McCartney songbook and we came up with uh, there are places I remember, you know, that uh, in my life. Well, damn, in the in the next 30 seconds, the whole tent was swaying. They all knew the song, all my life and somewhere in me. And the whole tent was rocking, singing Lennon McCartney as we were in a blizzard in the middle of the Gobi Desert. And that's the kind of experiences that you take, you take with you, you, you interact, you're uncomfortable, you're drinking stuff you don't want to drink, you're eating stuff you don't want to drink, but it was one of the most galvanizing things I've ever experienced. And we stumbled home that night over to our gear and, uh, and just said that was amazing. Not only amazing that we saw it, amazing that they knew that deep into the Beatles catalog. Who knew, you know? But that's, uh, we talked about how small the world was, right? It's big, but it's small. Um, so it was a fun night and, uh, and boy, it is my head was pounding the next day as we went uh, on our camels out to the sand dunes. Um, another place that I've spent a lot of time in is Iceland and Iceland, of course, is now the world's playground in the mid eighties. When I first went for national geographic, there was no tourism. It was just starting. And it was a very, very, um, wild place, you know? Um, and, um, but it's another place, uh, the land, the people um, really, really resonate with me. And I've got 40 year old friendships uh, with the people I met that, on that first uh, assignment. But, you know, these are um, a farm couple up in the, uh, the Western fjords of Iceland. And the way I found them, you know, a, a lot of people say, well, how do you how do you find these? I decided that in order to meet the local people, I contracted, I contacted rather a priest, a, a local priest. And I said, do you make rounds? I know like in rural, rural areas, a lot of times pastors will make rounds. And he said, yeah. He said, but I don't use a car or a truck. I use a speedboat because we're all on fjords. And um, so I went on, uh, on rounds with a pastor in his speedboat. And this is a brother and sister, actually. And I was the first flesh and blood American they had ever seen. And I, and it was just an amazing, amazing encounter. The priest, uh, the pastor was, you know, translating and everything, but they were, they weren't sure. They weren't really sure if I was human Martian or whatever, but uh, it, it was a, it was a stunning encounter. And I'm sure their grandchildren today are running hang gliding operations for the zillions of tourists that come up to the West fjords now, but back in the day, it was a little different. Um, and this man, Svenborn Beintainsen, was a farmer, a hermit, a Norse priest, and a, and a, a, a protester, uh, a social activist. And um, Svenborn allowed me to spend a couple of days in, in his farm with him. Uh, and again, no language and not much. He's not he wasn't the most outgoing guy, but he tolerated me. But what Svenborn used to do was um, uh, there was a NATO base up in Iceland in those days, and they weren't too happy about that, a lot of the Icelanders. So he would he would go and, and do these old Norse chants at the gate of the NATO base. 
and all the all the NATO troops would laugh at him and everything. He had a, a horse's head made out of paper mache, and he was chanting the Norse uh, curses at them. And um, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, there is no NATO base in Iceland now, and the Norse religion in Iceland is blooming. So he he had something going there. And uh, it, it, but it was a it was a wonderful encounter even though it was largely nonverbal. Um, but these are the, um, the kind of uh, uh, encounters that I think um, if you slow down and you allow yourself to, to meet the people, to talk, and you'll be uncomfortable. Believe me, I was uncomfortable with the Chinggis Khan vodka. I was uncomfortable being in this man's farmhouse and not really being able to understand. But there's some kind of a there's a connection that happens with time and um, and time is, is the thing that we don't have a lot of. Uh, and that's the, our most precious commodity. I think as photographers to spend the time, you know, we talk about fast food, fast food being junk food, fast travel is the same way. So slow travel, getting, getting, taking your time. Don't go to seven countries for three days each, go to one country for 21 days and kind of learn about it. Another little anecdote from Iceland, you know, you're shooting for the National Geographic. They've seen every wildlife picture of a puffin there is to see. Little puffins with fish out of their mouth, flying puffins. You can't impress them with sheep pictures or puffin pictures because they've seen it all down there. So in my research, I found out that there was actually in the summers in Iceland, not so much anymore, uh, but back in the day, uh, they used to send guys out to these remote islands to hunt puffins because smoked puffin is an Icelandic summer treat. We had the good humor trucks. They have smoked puffin. All I had to do was get over to Bjarnare Island and get up to Lover Johnson's little cottage up there. And I was on the main island of the Westman Islands in the southern part of uh, Iceland. And um, I asked, well, how can I get over there? And they said, well, you just we'll drop you off on the Zodiac and you just go up the cliff. There's a rope there. It's so easy. A cow can do it. All right. Fair enough. I mean, I was younger than I am today, but um, I've never been Jimmy Chin or Alex Honold. You know, I was not a mountain climber. Uh, so they, they brought me over and uh, they dropped me off. And um, and this was what Icelandic cows can do. They can go straight up uh, a sheer wall for 400 feet. Who knew uh, they have wings maybe, but uh, I had to make it up there and across to Hlover Johnson's place. And it was not without its difficulty. In fact, there were several times when I just thought, you know, if I let go of this rung, it'll all be over and I won't have to suffer any of the humiliation of not getting the pictures, you know, but I, I hung on and I made it up to the top uh, with the help of Flover's um, uh, young, very strong Viking assistant. And, um, I saw them hunting puffins. They would net the birds, they would kill them, they would uh, make circles of about 20 birds, they'd throw them off the cliff and they'd circle down. And as they hit the water, they, they made a loud noise, just like a, almost like a rifle shot. And, uh, but you know, Hlover, he was not uh, a charming guy. Um, uh, and this is the shot that they ended up using in the magazine, Lover uh, festooned with puffins. They had to admit that they had never seen a puffin shot like that. Um, but it took three days of scaling 400 foot cliffs, uh, eating smoked puffin meals three times a day, uh, surly company, blustery weather, and sleeping on the floor of his hut. It was, um, it was a hard won picture, probably not worth the effort, but there you go. So uh, I, at this time, I was working with a writer, a very um, uh, a wonderful writer, staff writer named Louise Levathes. And she heard from my fixer that I was over on the island interviewing Clover Johnson. And uh, she said, oh, I'd like to interview him, too. I'd like to, you know. So um, she had a better idea. She chartered a chopper for a 20 minute ride from Reykjavik. She flew over. She interviewed the Puffin Hunter. She hopped back in the, the chopper and flew back. And her total elapsed time was about three, three and a half hours, which is why when writers think they're smarter than photographers, some of them might actually have a point. But, um, but I think mine made for a deeper memory. Uh, you suffer, you have memories. It's, uh, it's the way of the world. 
Um, and you know, when you're photographing people, you just never know what those pictures are going to mean to them or to you as time passes. And um, one of the uh, um, uh, photos I made in, in Iceland was coming back. My fixer, uh, Elliot Sigurdsson, and I were driving back to Reykjavik late one night. It was the middle of summer, uh, late sun. We saw these kids playing at a farm and we started shooting them and, and making pictures and joking around with them. And lo and behold, this picture ended up making it on the cover. Had I known the editor was going to like it, I would have filled in the shadows with a little reflector or whatever. But who knew? Again, you know, you're just shooting, documenting the, the situation. And of course, um, Iceland is a small place. Uh, so I was able to track her down in later years. She became somewhat of a of a phenom there. Uh, she became famous when she was on the cover there. And it turns out that years later, I tracked her down and she was working as a picture researcher at Iceland's only stock photo agency. And uh, we had a lovely reunion and lunch and she showed me a shoebox full of letters that she had received from little girls all around the world saying, I look like you, you know? So it was, it was lovely, but time passes, things change. And, um, Facebook happened and, um, I got a, a message from her and, uh, and I'll read this real quick. Um, in 1986, some Americans stopped by our farm on a beautiful summer evening to take photos of me, my sister, my older brother, and my, my little brother, where we were playing on a horse. The following year in February, my portrait appeared on the cover of National Geographic, where the cover article was about Iceland. In September 2012, my sister was dying. And in a desperate attempt to hold on to anything that could remind me of better days, I wrote to the photographer and asked whether he still had some of the other photos he took that evening. He replied and said he remembered having taken some photos of the little boy, but not my sister. However, he said he'd look. A few days later, he contacted me, said he found four slides and that indeed my sister was on two of them, scanned them, sent them to me. I cried as those memories came to life on my computer screen. I then had the photos enlarged and printed and gave my little brother two of them for his 30th birthday. I also showed them to my sister, who by then was almost lost in the haze caused by terminal brain virus. She looked at me without recognizing me. Then her eyes wandered to the photos lying in front of her. She smiled for about three seconds before her eyes went blank again. But what a smile. She died a week later. Yeah. So you just never know. So, so genuine encounters, caring about the people you photograph, remaining in contact. I still get Christmas cards from people I photographed in the Bahamas 40 years ago. This is the kind of authenticity that buying followers on Instagram through some not going to get you. It's not going to get you the authentic photographs that that move people, that touch people. So um, let's let's keep moving on. Um, other places that have uh, touched me in in a way: uh, Scotland, Ireland, England. My mom was a war bride from England. I'm, I have a British passport in, uh, in term, in, in addition to an American passport. You can tell by my very British accent. Um, but it's a fabulous place. Those islands, uh, those Scottish islands are, are phenomenal. This is Fingal's Cave. This was like one of the wonders of the world in the Victorian era. Mahler came here and wrote a symphony about it. Queen Victoria came to look at it. Um, nobody shoots this better than Jim Richardson, who's, I think, spoken here to a, a, a friend and a fellow geographic photographer who has made Scotland, by the way, his specialty. So he knows more about Scotland than most Scots do. So he could have traveled the world and done a lot of kind of like, you know, a uh, mile wide and two inch deep coverage, but he chose to, to he, he loves Scotland. He chose to, to make that his specialty, to make that his own. And his pictures are amazing. Um, but uh, the, the standing stones of Callanish, when I started shooting the black and white, I, I, um, I tended to uh, use uh, uh, an infrared converted uh digital camera for the for the uh, landscapes and then just regular black and white for the the people but i really love um the the infrared uh occasionally i was stuck with an infrared camera when when a interesting character came up but usually it was infrared for landscapes and regular black and white for people um and the people are phenomenal they're authentic they're the real deal this is mick and his dog alpha and they say you start looking like your pets 
Well, uh, here's living proof uh, <laughs> that it can happen. Um, so um, these are the uh, seven churches in the Aran Islands uh, in uh, off the coast of Ireland. And I spend a fair amount of time in pubs. Um, it's all research. It's all for the for the pictures. Uh, but I, I just love the characters in pubs. We don't have we don't have an equivalent of a pub um, uh, in America. We have sports bars, we have cocktail bars, but we don't have a pub. And a pub is like everybody's living room away from home. And you really get some characters in them. Um, and I love to spend time in, uh, in pubs and, and, and finding these characters. This story, uh, my wife and I were on a hike in Cornwall where my mom is from. And we were in this village and as we were walking, um, this was the village where we were going to have our, our pub lunch after a hike. And uh, we noticed as we walked in the village, everybody was singing hymns in the church. And we got to the pub and there was only this guy here. And uh, his name is escaping, dude. I think it was Sid. I'm not sure. But anyway, he looked despondent. And the reason he was despondent was that he had lost his wife about six months ago and the funeral in the church was for his best friend and he just couldn't bear to go to that funeral so we started chatting him up bought him a beer i started shooting and peggy who's like a, a ray of sunshine she starts chatting him up asking him about his wife and about his friend and everything and by the time we finished with him he was laughing and then all his mates came in after the service and uh, we, we stayed around for the rest of the day and we were welcome guests at a funeral, you know, uh, all because we reached out, we spent some time. And these are the kind of um, encounters that you'll remember uh, if, you, if you try to have them and you, you go after them. A couple of other places where I've spent a lot of time has a lot of character. New Jersey, where I was born and raised in the Caribbean, um, I spent a lot of time in the Caribbean um, uh, in the 80s and the 90s shooting all the beautiful islands and everything. But I always kind of kept the camera aside for for the real things. And, and this is a portrait of a midwife, a spiritual back, Baptist midwife named the matron. And uh, she's holding in her hands a book with the names of the over 1000 babies she's delivered in the small two bed midwife hospital way up in the hills of Tobago. And then Robert Smith uh, told me he had been a parishioner at this church in Long Island in the Bahamas for 77 of his 83 years. So these kind of, these are the pictures, they're hard won, but you remember them, you remember the people. Um, this is uh, Pedro, he's the caretaker of a long defunct sugar mill in, um, in outside of Sin Fuego in Cuba. And uh, you can tell I live in the suburbs because the leaf blowers have started here. So uh, pardon me and the background sound there. Um, another place that I spent a lot of time when I did my first coverage of, uh, of New Jersey for National Geographic was the Pine Barrens. People don't really realize it, but uh, New Jersey, the southern part of New Jersey is one of the largest wilderness um, areas on the East Coast. And this, uh, the people that live back there were called the Pineys. Now they're called retirement communities because they're just lined with retirement communities. But there's still some parts of the deep woods. Uh, and this is Joe Albert, who had so many deer around him that they would eat apples right out of his mouth. They were so, you know, these are wild deer. This isn't a petting zoo. But Joe was so much part of the, uh, of the, of the landscape. And Sammy Hunt was a, 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 a banjo player, a harmonica player, a furniture maker, a boat builder just an amazing guy. And I photographed him first for my geographic story in 79, 80. And I photographed him over the years, just an incredible character. And um, at one point, the Smithsonian uh, Institution did uh, a whole display about the Pine Barrens. And they brought down one of Sammy's uh, steam bent rocking chairs. And they brought one of his special, uh, it's a, a duck hunting boat unique to the Barnegat Bay called uh, a sneak box. And it was quite an honor to have your stuff featured in there. And at the time, President Reagan was going to open the exhibit. So I went to Sammy and I said, Sammy, 
you're going to go down to DC, man. I said, the, the president's going to be there. You could shake the hand of the president. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, I ain't going to go down there. I'm not going to go down there. And I said, well, why not, Sammy? Do you travel much? He said, oh, hell yeah, I travel. He said, I went all the way to Trenton once. <laughs> Trenton, 30 miles as the crow flies from his house. And I thought, you know, in these last two years during the COVID thing, uh, we're all Sammy Hunt now, or we were all Sammy Hunt for two years. We didn't get much further than 30 miles from our house. But uh, Sammy was the happiest, one of the most happy, most creative guys I, I ever uh, I ever kind of encountered. So, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how far you travel. It matters how you travel. And uh, and um, here, here's a quote uh, from from the late, great Anthony Bourdain. And my little window is blocking this, so I'm going to have to make it up. It seems that the more places I, whoops, hold on. Let me go back there again. Sorry. I got a quick path. It seems the more places I see and experience, the bigger the world is, or the more I become aware of, the more I realize how relatively little I know of it, how many places I still have to go, how much there is to learn. Maybe that's enlightenment enough to know that there is no resting place of the mind, no smug clarity. Perhaps wisdom is realizing how small I am and unwise and how far I have yet to go. We lost this guy, you know, he was a Jersey boy too. grew up in Leonia. Um, so what can you do? What can I do for more authentic travel experiences? You can avoid traveling on big cruise ships, you know, these kind of group things, bus tours, cruise ships. When you're going to Europe, you can try the second cities rather than the first cities. If you go to right now, Venice, Florence, Rome, you're going to be photographing other tourists taking pictures. If you really want a touch and a taste of Italian city life with beautiful architecture, all the same stuff, you try Bologna, you try Torino, you try the less famous places because you won't be one of 300 photographers taking the same picture. Now, in a way, I realize it's easy for me to say, because I've seen a lot of these great sites and everything like that. And perhaps you're not as traveled yet and you haven't. So you want to see Florence and you want to see Venice and you want to see these places. And I'm, I'm not here to stop you, but I'm saying if you really want to feel and photograph Italy, the way Italians live, you might want to think about uh, at least spending some time in one of the second cities, get your, get your shots of the Coliseum with everybody there and, you know, and get your shots of the leaning tower of Pisa with the, in your hand and all that stuff, but go to one of these other places to get th that try service or educational based travel programs that force you to interact with the locals so that you can't kind of shoot through the bus window. You got to reach out. You got to, you have to experience the life, even if you're not quite as comfortable as you should be. And the other thing is to try planting in one rather than touring around. You have fewer notches in your travel belt, but you have more in-depth encounters. And that's kind of what my philosophy of traveling has been in these last few years. And I want to share with you a little uh, quick three minute video about the place that's been my kind of home away from home for, well, I started going down there in the 90s, but I started living part time down there about seven years ago. And this is a movie made by uh, uh, AOL.com for a series that they called Lifers. It has nothing to do with time spent in prison. It's uh, people who have done the same job for over 40 years. And I qualified, you know, so they they sent a crew down a young guy actually that I know a friend of my son who's a, a great videographer and has a wonderful uh, production company, and they did this little story, and uh, it's it's uh, it, it shares some of my uh, my feelings about travel and planting, and I just like viewers to. Uh, to point out that since this film was made, I've lost 60 pounds. So if you could, while you're watching this, imagine me thinner, uh, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so here we go, three minutes and then we'll take some questions. You know, one thing that you pick up when you've hit as many countries as I have, you just see a lot of different and very unique cultures. And the thing that strikes me about this is that on one level, we're all the same. 
We all want a secure life for ourselves and our family. We all want a good life for our children. And that's, that's the basic kind of uh, human condition. But overlaid in that is this, these amazing cultures and languages, the variety, the, the richness of the human tapestry. So my, my thing has kind of been to try to bring back the stories of different cultures to people in the United States through the magazines and the websites and everything like that because it's important to have a sense of the world. My name is Bob Christ and I'm a photographer. I've been a professional since 1976. Working for the National Geographic is just about every uh, still photographer's dream and it was my dream, you know, because I had traveled. I, was, I didn't want to spend my life in Jersey City and Hoboken. I was able to get this appointment with Bob Gilka, that director of photography at National Geographic. He just tore me apart. Kid, if you want to be a better photographer, you're going to have to stand in front of more interesting stuff. So I had a story proposal called The New Jersey Nobody Knows. And he threw the contract across the desk at me and said, here kid, why don't you try it, see how you do. I loved it. The minute I picked up the camera and started documenting my travels, it, it really resonated with me. It, now, don't get me wrong, there are some hardships involved with this, you know, dream job of traveling the world on somebody else's nickel. There aren't too many intact marriages among my colleagues who do this kind of work. That's the secret to our marriage, is that we have been married 43 years, but we haven't spent 43 years together. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Soon after we had children, my wife stayed home from her corporate job and started working for me. Uh, she would manage my schedule, book assignments, so we worked as a team. When I started tagging along with him, uh, I was given the title, and he even had a little badge for me called Tripod Sherpa. <laughs> For me, for a photograph to really work, it has to have three elements. It has to have great light, it has to have strong composition, and it has to have that sense of moment. Why are you slicing off this 125th of a second and not the one before or after? I don't have a plan to retire. I, I, I think retirement for me is just gonna be slowing down. I think a better word instead of retire is reinvent. I still shoot plenty of stills, but I, I, the short video documentary for online stuff is, is really my new passion. One of the things I'm enjoying about this period of life is coming up with my own stories. And if an editor doesn't want it, the heck with it, I'll do it anyway. I've been looking for interesting stuff to stand in front of for the last 40 years. All right. Thank you. and. Uh... We'll take some questions. I'll stop the share here. It's me. I'm back. All right. <laughs> I told you I'd be back, Bob. Oh, good. Uh, I want to. I, I want to start off by saying thank you so much uh, because I, I don't know. I, I can't speak for the masses, and you know, chime in. Let us know uh, if you want. But that 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 was just awesome, and and I loved watching every second of that and listening to you speak. Uh, well, thank you. It, it, it was it was just great. So so thank you so much. Uh, by saying that, my pleasure. With sincerity. Um, I thought it was I thought it was really funny. You know, we you talked a little bit about some of your travels, and you talked about immersing yourself in the culture a little bit, and um, you know, being being in that tent and everybody breaking out into the song of uh, you know with uh, of the Beatles, and and it's just so interesting how how culture is so wide and how we take it for granted it, it it actually reminded me of i don't know if you remember the story of rodriguez um yeah um he's this the guy who was famous in south south africa right exactly exactly you know and yeah. a guy who went you know just completely in, in in his hometown nobody knew him he was just a regular everyday guy and halfway around the globe you know it just goes to show that that no matter what there's stuff that ties us together um, so that's beautiful. We've got a ton of questions rolling in, so I do want to get to them. Sure. Um, we've got Kathy starting off from Vimeo. She wants to know, uh, actually, she started with a statement, I should say. The portraits are spectacular, timeless places. Are you setting these people up, or are they just candid images? Um, it's a mix. It's a mix of um, of of 
you know, post portraits and, and candid grabs. Um, uh, I would say the majority, it's about half and half. If they're in the right light and they got the right background, um, then you just you just work around them. Uh, if if you have their cooperation and their uh, but they're you know sitting in front of a bright doorway and you're inside, you may ask them to move around a little. Um, so it, it it it's a situational thing. If the situation allows, if you're lucky enough, you know those are portraits. They're not street scenes. So you know I wouldn't set up a street scene. I'm not that talented. I, I, you know, I admire advertising and corporate photographers who can create scenes. I've always been a picture discoverer. If I find a good picture and I look relentlessly, then I can take a pretty good picture. But if you, if you gave me, you know, a half a dozen Peruvian flute players and told me to set up a situation, I couldn't do it. So, but I can, you know, slightly direct somebody to, to sit in a different place or whatever once I, once I break the ice there. So it's a situational thing uh for the portraits wonderful i wanted i wanted to touch on that because that's a question that that i think came to mind um you know you you talk about traveling and you talk about you know not going to the florence the venice you know the, the popular places going to these smaller towns and and situating yourself with the people uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that in terms of how you achieve that. You know, when when you're going out for assignment and trying to capture these images with people, is that something that you have help from the the the, the magazine who's sending you or whoever might be sending you? Or that's a that's a great question. And you know, uh, you might have heard me use the term fixer a couple of times. And a fixer is usually a local a guide who's kind of hip to to what photographers and film crews need and stuff like that. And we will often uh, work with a fixer uh, because, you know, you're a stranger in a strange land. You probably don't speak the language. How do you find fixers? Um, very many ways, you know, I'm kind of lucky. I've been in the business for 40 some odd years. And I know a lot of other people who've been in the business for 40 something years and everybody's got their favorite fixers. But if, you know, if you don't have that kind of uh, resource and friend network, usually a tourist board, wherever you're going, you can call them and ask them for um, the names of guides who are used to working with film crews. And these are the people who, who know what you need and who know where the good angles are and can help you along there and help you speak the language. I did um, a story on Malta for National Geographic and the government press office gave me the fixer, the, the first three fixers I went through. And they were all PhDs in architecture and art history, and they would all stand in front of the, the cathedral and say, and this cathedral was built in 1130 and Caravaggio painted this. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. But can we go in over to the, the longshoremen having lunch there and get and talk to the longshoremen in the in the shipyard? And they're like, oh, longshoremen, why I'm an academic, you know, and I was I was not getting with the people I was getting a walking history book. And so um, one night I was in the bar where I used to eat uh, dinner and there was a guy who was holding court. He had a table full of people and I could hear some English and he was making jokes and everybody's laughing. And I asked the bartender, I said, who is that guy? And he said, Oh, that's Tony. He's the policeman. He just retired. And uh, he knows everybody on the Island. And I was like, ah, oh. Tony, the retired policeman who speaks English and can hold an entire bar wrapped with his stories. So I went over and introduced myself. Tony didn't know what year anything was built, but he took me to his like cousin's uh, first communion ceremony. He took me out sailing with his buddies. So you, you find fixtures that way. Sometimes you can, um, if you're a member of a PPA, Professional Photographers of America, they have chapters all over the world. They have host photographers in their countries who are willing to act as your guide when you come uh, over, if you're a member of that organization and you organize it through there. So there's a number of ways that you can find fixers. They're, they're basically guides who are a little hip visually and who kind of can tell you about the cathedral, but they can get you into the longshoremen's uh, uh, social club too. Those That's the ideal fixer. Uh, so uh, especially if you don't speak the language and, and, you know, I don't have too many regrets in my life, but I am monolingual. I, I have tried and tried 
And I mean, I can get by and order beer in maybe a half a dozen languages, but I can't get much further than that. So I am really dependent upon the kindness of fixers, you know. So it's been an important part of of being able to to break through that that cultural wall that that not speaking the language. If you speak the language, God bless you. I mean, it's just such it's just such an advantage, you know. Uh, and it's an advantage I've never had. I've tried, but I don't know. It, it just doesn't sink in. It's all right. It's all right. I, I'm I'm with you on the monolingual. So uh, <laughs> peas, peas in a pod. You see, I, I did hear you use the term fixer, but but over here, you know, you're you're an East Coast guy. You said you were out in Jersey, and I'm a Brooklyn guy. Like I told you before, fixer has a different meaning over here. You know. <laughs> so, oh uh, yeah. I, I, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm speaking in <laughs> traditional journalistic word of fixer. Uh, there you go. Now, now, Marsha, who is joining us on Vimeo, uh, asks, what type of equipment do you use for your travels? Do you travel as light as possible? Yes, I travel very light. Uh, he who travels lightest travels farthest. And um, I use, well, I'm going to confess it. I use mostly Sony's amateur equipment <laughs> because uh, uh, because it's light. Um, my, my current favorite camera is a four-year-old camera called the RX-10 IV. It's one of those bridge cameras, one inch chip, but it has a 24 to 600 millimeter zoom, fabulous image quality, 4k video, mic jack, headphone jack. And there isn't a shot when I'm covering a, a procession, a bullfight or whatever it is, there isn't a shot I can't get with a, with a little camera that has a 24 to 600. And then the, the, the drawback of the, of the smaller chip is that it's not that great in low light. So then I supplement that with an, a Sony a7C and a couple of the small cheap zooms, uh, the 16 to 35 F4 and the 24 to 70 F4. And then they just came out with these little tiny fast primes and I, I've got those. But um, I don't, I mean, I've reached the point in my career where um, I can afford to buy just about any lens I want. I just don't want to carry them. <laughs> so, so I wish I had, uh, you know, I wish I, I had that when I could, when I, ha I had a back and a knees that worked uh, because, you know, I'd love to be working with those big, um, those big fast um, lenses. But I find that uh, the small zooms and the small primes do well for me. And, you know, everybody's got to work. You know, like Clint Eastwood said in Dirty Harry, man's got to know his limitations. And and um, my limitation is I can't haul a 30 pound bag and be good for more than an hour. If I want to be good for a 10, 12 hour day, that bag has to be light and we have to take many breaks, you know. Uh, so um, so that's that's my basic gear set up for stills and um, uh, video these days. Great. And, and just to follow up on a question we got, because uh, we, we got a question on Vimeo from a, a viewer asking what Bob's age is. I'm just going to answer that easily for him. Bob's old enough that he can quote Clint Eastwood from Dirty Harry <laughs> off the top of his head. So there you go. There's, there's your answer on uh, that. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, let's just put it this way. I'm beyond retirement age. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now, now Elizabeth wants to uh, know if you could repeat the statement the gentleman told you about being a better photographer. Oh, okay. Um, um, this is... Um, I attributed this to Bob Gilka, but it, it could be that my friend Jim Richardson said it, uh, but it's become one of those kind of photographic saws, like the best camera is the one you have with you. You know, who first said that? I think I know, but it wasn't me. But um, the, the saying is, if you want to become a better photographer, you're going to have to stand in front of more interesting stuff. And of course, it sounds like a Zen kind of a thing. But uh, as Jim Richardson, if, if you ever get a chance to study with Jim in one of his workshops or whatever, that guy researches the hell out of everything he does. So, so do I, because the trick, you know, uh, we used to have this saying in newspaper photography that the secret of a great news photograph is F8 and be there. And we as photographers, especially in the YouTube teaching generation, we tend to obsess on the F8 portion there. Like, what lens did you use? Was it a GM lens or was it a Kate lens? And it's like, no, 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 no. If you don't know where to stand, if you're not standing in front of the Papua New Guinea guys during their twice annual uh, 
uh, convention or whatever, you it doesn't matter what lens you have. If there's nothing happening, you're not going to get the picture. So the real art is in being there, in being in the right place at the right time, and that often you know uh, means research um, and and picking the time that you go as well as where you're going. So so standing in front of more interesting stuff has been for most journalists slash travel photographers that's the secret it's not it's not whether you got the 3518 the 3514 or the 3512 or what your bokeh balls look like it's what's happening in front of the lens that's really going to make or break the picture nice bokeh fine but you know only a fellow youtuber is going to say geez that was, a, there was those bokeh balls are a little ovoid I don't know, you know, meanwhile, you know, you're getting a picture of uh, the, the headhunters of, of, of Papua New Guinea doing their great dance and the makeup and stuff like that. Nobody cares about the boat. It's, yeah, it's sharper. It isn't. So so you, you got to you got to concentrate on the on the being there, F8 and be there. Being there is, I think, the secret to to really get cranking up the, the quality of the travel photography. Awesome. So there you go. Now you have Bob's secret. No, nothing, nothing hidden left. You know what you do. You got to do. You got to, you got to get out. You got to be there. Uh, we got a ton of comments that came in. Uh, amazing. Thank you for your view of the world. Uh, just everybody. Great presentation. Thank you so much. So uh, I want to, I want to follow up and reiterate that again, Bob. Thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. Want to thank Sony as well for sponsoring the event. One last question for the masses, because people always want to know. I know, I know this is authentic travel photography, and we were talking about capturing authentic images, but we still are in the age of Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Where can where can people find you in the digital media age? Oh, they can find me on Instagram. I'm not the most <laughs> um, uh, uh, conscientious Instagram or Facebook. Uh, bobchris.com. Um, I'm currently working. I'm, I, I was hoping I would be able to announce it, but I'm working on a, a series of five hour long travel documentaries for an educational, big educational website that's going to launch any day now, as soon as they do the audience research on the proper title. So uh, when that comes, um, I'll be announcing and pounding that to death on Facebook. Um, I'm more active on Facebook than I am on Instagram. Uh, but uh, bobchris.com is my website. And, uh, and this, this uh, travel documentary series, I have high hopes for. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll catch you there. Well, Bob, thanks again to everybody joining us today. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome back to us. I, we can we can do that, right? Welcome back to us. We're back. We're excited to be here. Uh, we'll catch you shortly. But this has been another edition of the B and H Virtual Event Space. Catch you next time. Okay. Bye bye.